In November 1732, General James Oglethorpe sailed from Gravesend, England, with 112 passengers to establish a colony for, quote, the unemployed and the unemployable, end quote, somewhere between the Savannah and Altamaha Rivers. After ports of call in Charleston and Port Royal, South Carolina for rest, provisions, and intelligence, the group set off for the bluffs of the Savannah River, within the boundaries prescribed by the trustees, but as far from the Spanish in Florida as he could get. Nevertheless, one purpose of George's establishment was to serve as a buffer between the interests of the two hostile nations. Oglethorpe came with a plan to provide means for the colonists' self-reliance and economic advancement and to fortify against the Spanish threat. So the layout divided the town into six wards for homes and gardens with acreage nearby. Each ward had a central square for neighborhood meetings and mustering the citizen militias. After his party arrived on February 1, 1733, Oglethorpe gained permission from Tamachichi, Miko of the nearby Yamacross, to settle. He encamped on the bluff and began supervising Savannah's establishment. Oglethorpe returned to England for the final time in 1743. By 1749, the fledgling colony was near collapse and returning to wilderness, constrained by Oglethorpe's ban on slavery. However, the ban was repealed after his departure, and with significant investments by South Carolina planters, the colony's decline began to turn around. Little, if anything, along the riverfront from those days has survived. The oldest structural remnants date from about 1806. Let's view the riverfront from the Bay Street level, noting the buildings and commenting along the way. Then we'll go down a level to see the underside, the utilitarian underbelly, if you will. Next, we'll check out River Street and the Bay Street parks. This duplex, private residences at 318 and 320 Williamson Street, was built for Mary Bradley in 1872. The expansive trade in cotton welcomed the building of this structure for United Hydraulic Cotton Compress Company. It was destroyed by fire in 1898 and rebuilt within the shell of the earlier business. This range was probably built for John Williamson Jr. John Sr., a wealthy planter and former mayor of Savannah died in 1843. Jr. bought his father's Brampton plantation nearby but was financially ruined when Union General Sherman burned his home and fields. This structure burned in 1879 and again in 1898. The interior was rebuilt both times. The Johnston Range is the result of a family enterprise dating from 1763 beginning with Dr. Andrew William Johnston. The family traded in rice, tobacco, pork, rum, lumber, and other goods. It passed through several partnerships including Johnston's heirs and others. By 1876, it had fragmented and dwindled. George Loden was an oyster merchant operating between Bluffton, South Carolina, and Savannah. He sold oysters under the label Venus Point Brand Cove Oysters. Loden died in Hot Springs, Arkansas in 1917. He's buried in Savannah's Bonaventure Cemetery. 202 through 206 West Bay is the oldest surviving building in this ward, completed in 1818. Constructed of ballast stone, it's the only such cotton warehouse in the country. We'll talk about ballast stone a little later. Taylor, who lived from 1769 through 1840, was an immigrant merchant from Scotland. In addition to cotton, he sold all manner of goods from his wharf including such things as crockery, china dinnerware, cans and teapots, military pouches, knapsacks, sabers, and salt. George Wimberly Jones, 1827 to 1880, was a scion of one of George's oldest and wealthiest families. By the age of 21, he was known for his extensive collection of books and papers relating to George's history. Sadly, most of his earlier collection was plundered and stolen by Yankees during the war between the states, but he built another extensive collection after the war. Historians owe much to George's work. The Telfair family was another notable Savannah family with international connections. The family's mercantile acumen is reflected in this range. Architects Shaw and Fay designed other noteworthy buildings along the wharf and elsewhere. 
This memorial bench was placed in 1906 by the Georgia Society of the Colonial Dames of America on the site where General Oglethorpe is thought to have encamped. Continuing eastward, the next handsome building is City Hall, designed by Hyman Whitcover. Born in South Carolina in 1871, Whitcover moved to Savannah, where he became a prominent architect. His works included the Scottish Rite Masonic Temple in Jasper Ward. He was a member of Congregation McVie Israel, a Freemason, and member of the Georgia Hussars. City Hall stands on the site of the City Exchange, which was destroyed by fire in 1796, rebuilt, then served as City Hall until it was demolished in favor of the present building. The bell from the old City Exchange's bell tower is located a little to the east of City Hall. Built solely as Savannah's seat of government, it was built in the Renaissance Revival style of limestone and granite. The dome is copper and was overlaid with gold leaf in 1987. Leaving City Hall, we'll cross under this Confederate jasmine arch toward the Thomas Gamble building on Factors Walk, then take a look at the cobblestone ramp below. This wall and its cavernous rooms, which we just spotted from above, have been a subject of confusion and contention since 1839. Before that, the embankment was being held up with rotten boards. The city council invited bids to construct a brick wall. Charles Kluski, a local architect, was awarded the contract because his bid was the cheapest. Along the way, he proposed building these vaults. Well. The project proceeded at a snail's pace and the public couldn't figure out what these were for. Were they caves? Tombs? Prison cells? Their patients worn thin. City Council replaced Kluski with another builder. To this day, these holes in the wall are the subjects of curiosity. These rooms are mysterious indeed. Returning to the factor's walk level, we see again the Kelly block, to the left. This is a nearly identical replica of his building that burned in 1876. Kelly was a very successful Irish-American businessman with interests in New York and San Francisco. He is credited with rebuilding much of Charleston, South Carolina after the Civil War. Kelly was also a founder of Catholic University of America in Washington, D.C., and served on a committee overseeing the construction of St. Patrick's Cathedral in New York. The city of Savannah purchased the block in 1945 for office space and named it after Thomas Gamble, former mayor of Savannah. John Stoddard was a cotton merchant and planter. John was born in Massachusetts in 1809 and was a partner in the firm of Edwards and Stoddard in Boston. He moved to Savannah with his wife, Mary, and lived at 15 West Perry Street which he built in 1867 overlooking Chippewa Square. He was a director of the Augusta and Waynesboro Railroad. It later became the Augusta and Savannah Railroad. He was a ruling elder at Savannah's Independent Presbyterian Church at the time of his death in 1879. Cotton was a most important staple during Savannah's early history. Here is where cotton was traded and shipped. The building was designed by William Gibbons Preston and completed in 1886. Preston designed other notable buildings around Savannah. The Terracotta Lion in front is one of Savannah's most photographed sculptures. But before the park, the Lion, and even the Cotton Exchange existed, there was a ramp leading downward from Drayton Street to the wharves along the river. To get permission to build, 
the city fathers were promised that the ramp access would remain. So the cotton exchange was built over the ramp, supported by cast iron pillars. That portion of the Drayton Street ramp still exists. The firm of Cleghorn and Cunningham, wholesalers, dealt in marine supplies necessary for shipping. Architects, Scholl and Fay, designed other ranges along Factors Walk, including the row seen in the distance, 112 through 130 East Bay, built for George Wimberly Jones in 1857. This building, 202 through 206 East Bay, was constructed for Archibald Smith, a businessman and city councilman, in 1823. The cross ends of earthquake bolts are clearly visible. Yes, Savannah has experienced earthquakes. The worst was in 1886 centered in Charleston. It was felt as far away as Boston and Chicago, with some far away speculating that Florida had separated from the mainland. These bolts might have been installed after that event. This range, separated from Archibald Smith stores by a stairway, was another built for John Stoddard. This, on East Bay, is known as the Lower Stoddard Range. It was built on the foundations of an earlier range, part of which was known as the Coffee House Wharf. During the Spanish-American War, the Signal Corps headquartered here. Andrew Lowe, a Scottish-American cotton merchant, retired in 1839 and returned to England. His teenage nephew, also named Andrew, came to work for the firm in 1829. After his uncle died, the younger Andrew inherited the company and properties. With offices in Savannah and Liverpool, he shipped cotton to England with his fleet of cargo ships and became the city's richest man. Andrew Lowe died in England in 1886. His body was returned to Savannah to be buried in Laurel Grove Cemetery. 318 and 320 East Bay, visible in the background, was built in 1826 for Amos Scudder. Amos was an architect and builder of several outstanding structures in the city, and the father of Ephraim and John Scudder, who were also notable builders in town. The range in the foreground was built in 1835 for George Anderson, a prominent cotton merchant and banker. Strolling up the easternmost end of Lower Factors Walk, we come to 504 through 516 East Bay Street. Built in 1889, it housed Tide Water Oil Company offices until the building burned in 1892. It was rebuilt, and Standard Oil Company bought Tide Water Oil and occupied the space until 1907. After a long vacancy, a blue jeans factory moved in until 1980. It is now the old Harbor Inn. Visitors to this area, known collectively as New Franklin Ward, can't help but notice these dark passageways below. They look spooky, are sometimes smelly, and seem not at all inviting. Before the River Street of today, these were the original river streets. Between the warehouses and the river were sailors, longshoremen, carts, horses, drays, bales, barrels, lumber, bricks, and whatever else you'd find being loaded or unloaded from ships. It seemed impassable. If you didn't take Bay Street to your destination along the river, you follow these corridors. Doorways led into offices, warehouses, storage units and public stores where folks could buy whatever they needed, such as paint, pots and pans, harnesses, boots, nails, tar, sugar, paper, rum, wine, fabric and weaponry. The earliest form of paving we find is the use of cobblestones. These were readily available. Sailing vessels needed weight in their holds to keep them upright. In the absence of heavy cargo, stones provided the weight, and they were collected or discharged at each port. Savannah's cobblestones are from all around the world. Stone pavement was better than mud, provided good traction, and could support heavy loads, but were tough on wheeled vehicles. Belgian block was used later in the 19th century. These are quarried stones, mostly of granite, of more or less uniform size. They provide a more even surface, plenty of traction, and can accommodate heavy loads with less of the bone-jarring effect. 
The next development is the vitrified brick. These were baked at a much higher temperature than regular brick, so produced a hard, durable surface, much better than the brick walls of homes, and they could be mass-produced at a lower cost. With the added advantage of allowing their respective brickworks to mark their products with a little advertising, you'll find handsome stone curbing all over historic Savannah. You'll also find modern embossed asphalt. Looks like cobblestone, but it's not. This system of retaining walls is another awesome feature of Factors Walk. Before the retaining walls, sloping, eroding soil embankments and ramps led to the wharves. Michael Cash, a newly arrived Irish stonemason, began construction in 1855. Edward C. Anderson was mayor at the time. Most of the project was completed by 1858. The walls run for about three-fourths of a mile and are 19 feet high, on average. The Civil War interrupted construction, and Union forces are thought to have used many of the stones in their failed stone fleet operation to blockade shipping. The rebuilding commenced in 1866. Edward C. Anderson was then serving his second term as mayor. The wall has been repaired and altered since its completion. Both Michael Cash and Mayor Anderson are memorialized in stone. Of all the breathtaking experiences awaiting visitors to River Street, the most terrifying might be the steep stone stairways. Find them beside ramps, descending walls, and in the dark recesses between historic buildings. They fascinate tourists and locals alike. One particularly hair-raising set has been called The Stone Stairs of Death and has been featured on YouTube, Facebook, and TikTok as intrepid climbers test their nerves. Sometimes when they've had one too many, each flight is posted with fresh bright yellow caution signs. You've been warned. There's no better place to begin a tour along River Street than in the Plant Riverside District. This $375 million, 670,000 square foot attraction was developed by hotelier Richard Kessler. By repurposing the old Savannah Electric Power Plant, circa 1912, it features an imaginative collection of hotels, restaurants, shops, bars, and artwork while retaining the twin smokestacks, old artifacts, and vintage brick exterior. On display are petrological and paleontological wonders. We'll continue eastward to River Street to view the lower portals of the warehouses and stores we viewed before. We're now behind the Cotton Compress Building, Williamson, and Johnston Ranges. The large portals were for hoisting cotton bales and other goods between the warehouses and wharf. Gift shops now occupy the lower levels of the Loden Building and Taylor Store. You'll never lack for food or drink along River Street. We're looking eastward behind the Jones and Telfair blocks. Railroad tracks remind us that this part was once a shipping transportation hub. Central of Georgia Railroad first laid tracks in 1889. Since then, rails have been added to, removed, and replaced. Not too long ago, a diesel train, the River Street Rambler, traversed this route, backing up traffic twice per day. It was retired in 1999. Later on, a public trolley passed through. Today, only motor vehicles ride the rails trying to smooth their passage over the Belgian block pavers. Several memorials can be seen along the river. Here's one marking the spot where Oglethorpe and his party are believed to have landed. This fountain celebrates Savannah's maritime history and several important vessels bearing the name, Savannah. This World War II memorial, entitled, A World Apart, honors veterans from Chatham County who served in that war. And the African-American monument sculpted by Dorothy Spradley. The Port of Savannah is the fourth largest in North America and the second largest on the East Coast, passing ships tugs, ferries, and dredges plying the river fascinate visitors several times per day. Container ships longer than city blocks and rivaling some of the city's highest buildings often blow their horns, which can be heard throughout Savannah. Many of us locals have apps on our cell phones to keep track of ship movements in and out of port. 
just for the fun of it. This expanse along the river, Rosakis Plaza, dedicated in 1977 and named for Mayor John Rosakis, replaced a dilapidated jumble of decayed wharves, which few people dared visit. It's now a world-famous tourist destination. With its ship traffic, historic buildings, and attractions, a visit to Savannah's River Street is a wonderful experience, except for this rather depressing tunnel beneath the Hyatt Regency Hotel. Thankfully, there's light at the end of the tunnel. Here's a view of City Hall and the Thomas Gamble Building on the left, Riverside. Let's take the steps between City Hall and the Klusky Vaults up to Emmett Park. Emmett Park was originally known as the Irish Green, but the name was changed in 1902 to commemorate Irish orator Robert Emmett upon the centennial of his death, though Emmett never visited Savannah. Emmett Park can be a welcome relief to the eye and mind after the hustle of River Street below. Just try to ignore the rumble on Bay Street. Savannah's parks and squares are famous for their memorials and monuments. Each boasts at least one, maybe two. Emmett Park has many more. The Washington guns, seen here, were presented to the Chatham Artillery by President George Washington after his visit to the city in 1791. One is British, the other is French. The British six-pounder was captured at Yorktown in 1781. Cast in 1758, it bears the coat of arms of King George II. The French gun was cast in 1756 and bears the emblem of the Sun King, Louis XIV. Here's the old city exchange bell, now housed in a replica cupola. The Salzburger Monument, in an area known as Salzburger Park, commemorates the landing in 1734 of Lutheran Protestants, driven from their homes in Salzburg. The Salzburgers settled outside of Savannah at New Ebenezer. The monument, carved out of green serpentine stone, tells the story of their exile. Conceived in 1984, it was commissioned by the governor of the state of Salzburg for the city of Savannah as an act of reconciliation. It was unveiled in 1994. The Celtic Cross Monument celebrates Savannah's Irish immigrants, many of whom worked on the nearby docks and lived in this part of the city. This canon commemorates the service of the Georgia Hussars, organized by Oglethorpe in 1736. The Hussars have served the nation with distinction from then to the present. The Vietnam Veterans Memorial honors the 106 members of the armed forces from Chatham County who died or were presumed dead, as well as the 25,000 other area veterans who served in that conflict. The old harbor light at the easternmost end of Emmett Park was erected in 1858 by the United States Lighthouse Board as an aid to navigation in the river. It was one of two such beacons that allowed pilots to have a line of sight into port. This enabled them to avoid running into sunken ships that the British had scuttled in the river during the Revolutionary War. The Waving Girl statue is down the ramp, below Emmett Park. Florence Martis lived on Elba Island, downstream from this point. From 1887 to 1931, she waved at ships passing by. One story claims that she was awaiting her long-lost lover. Ships would often blow their whistles in response, and some continue even today to give a blast from their horns in tribute. The 1996 Summer Olympics were hosted by Atlanta, Georgia. Atlanta, however, is landlocked, so the yachting events were held at Savannah. The Olympic flame entered Savannah on a sailing ship, carried throughout the state, and returned to Savannah for ceremonies in this park. The cauldron, designed by Georgia sculptor Ivan Bailey, stands as a permanent reminder of the event. Thanks for watching. Please give us a thumbs up and subscribe to our channel. To learn more about Savannah's historic riverfront, check out the description below. Do you have memories of Savannah? Please leave your comments. We'd love to hear from you.